I have the incredible opportunity in this church to open the church up at 6.30 in the morning while no one's here. The sun is rising and it's an incredible setting, so I take advantage of the quiet in the morning. God comes in incredibly hidden disguises. And until you and I can get engulfed with the mystery how God and Jesus Christ is in one another, we're going to miss the significance of what it means to understand the bread of life. God comes to us in some incredible form of being tangible, edible, and consumable. We are a privileged community because we do believe what Christ said today. I am the living bread. Father Bill, it's uh, great to be here with you. And the pleasure is ours to have you here. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks for your warm hospitality. But you call this church, St. Francis of Assisi, spirituality with a view. Why is that? Pretty obvious reason if you look out our view windows. You're going to be able to see North Lake Tahoe. You'll see the majestic mountains, the beauty of the trees. And it invites us, all of us to appreciate the beauty of God's environment. And it brings us all to a sense of spirituality and reflection. Exactly. Let me ask you this, um, the great American uh, writer, uh, John Updike, was once asked, what's your favorite piece of scripture? And he thought about it, and he said this, it comes from Thessalonians, St. Paul, don't stifle the spirit, oh, don't love quench that. the spirit. I love that. You're a guy who has not <laughs> quenched that spirit. No need, can't and do it here. How do you energize people? Uh, I think they bring the energy here. What happens, we have a lot of tourists and seasonal parishioners. They come in with their families. Their families are pretty vivacious. The kids are joyous. We take advantage of that. And I think you just get energized by their energy itself. You embrace the idea of uh, intentional discipleship. Can you explain? Oh, we love that. Actually, it's based on um, divine renovation. I'm sure you're familiar with that with J Father James Mellon. It's this whole idea of they need to make a choice to be evangelizers. So we encourage them to do that. We started out 13 years ago using the common terminology, lay ministers, lay volunteers. That didn't quite fit what we were aspiring to do because we wanted them to understand that they are disciples by their baptism and then they had to intend to share that so they could move on to becoming apostles. So our next step going from lay volunteers and then intentional disciples is we're eventually going to move them to help them recognize that they are going to be apostles. Not only do they have this personal commitment to Jesus Christ because of their discipleship, but then they want to get out and share it. They want to live it and be filled with that whole concept. So we really appreciate the concept of um, all of us share in the priesthood. We emphasize that here a lot by their baptism. Just have different responsibilities. As a preacher, you are a storyteller. And you have a new book out, Reflections of Father Bill. I have it right here, actually. Uh, uh, Reflections of Father Bill, a finely tuned balancing act. Um, what's the subtitle about? Actually, the parishioners have done this. It was their idea of they've been introduced to a faith that calls them to be disciples. They figured they wanted to evangelize, so they asked if they could go ahead and compile some of the homilies that we had shared. So it all came from them. There is a list in the back of the book, as you'll probably notice, of 12 people that were actively involved in making this happen. I had very little to do with it in reality. They named the book, 
and uh, they know that I enjoy the outdoors. Paddleboarding is something I do each morning if I can, and uh, they were out there to capture a picture which is on the cover, and it is actually a reflection of myself and then the, the beauty of Lake Tahoe itself. Well, you're a storyteller, but you're also someone who is an active preacher. I mean, you, you can't ignore Father Bill while you're here in this church. <laughs> There's some truth in that. Uh, some, a clear example is if uh, the babies cry, yeah, the parents like to do the quarterback sneak. I will call attention to them. I say, oh, no, 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 no quarterback sneak. We're baby friendly here. And please come back and enjoy the homily. And I will share with them that I had worked in prison for all those years and never heard a baby cry. So when I came to the parish setting, for me it was a very welcoming sound. And um, our parishioners are very appreciative that we encourage the young children to, uh, to be actively involved. They run up and down the aisle, I'll come down and meet them. If they're starting to cry, I will try to go over and hold them. Toward the end of your book, you write, the most challenging part of my ministry during the 25 years that I worked in prisons was getting inmates to believe in their self-worth and God's love. Uh, how do you do that? That was really difficult. They're pretty much pessimistic. They're hard on themselves because they're hard on everybody else. And you have to try to find their humorous side and their tender side, and then help them to understand that in God's eyes, we're all equal. We do bad things, but God still loves us. You have a New Year's homily, which is entitled The Lord's Blessing, which begins uh, with a very funny anecdote, and then it goes into uh, how we must be grateful at the new year. But then you go into a, a piece that is so touching and uh, so poignant, and it's about your early ministry uh, in the prisons. Could you read that one little selection? I will be happy to do that. So I had been ordained for only five years and had been re recently assigned to the Texas Department of Corrections in Huntsville, Texas. I was ministering to the inmates in the Ellis Unit, where death row is. James Applebaum was a convicted killer who had been on death row for over 27 years. On the day before he was to be executed, he asked if I would have his last meal with him and pray with him the following day prior to his execution. The warden granted me the permission. I was nervous. I obviously did not sleep all night. Instead, I searched the Old Testament for a fitting prayer for a Jewish inmate. I simply asked the Lord to guide me. As I read the sacred scripture, the Holy Spirit led me to the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. The next day, James and I bowed our heads, held hands, and we prayed. We walked together, escorted by the warden, and several security guards to the gas chamber. I told him, look into my eyes. And I would look into him. <laughs> As he'd be taken to his eternal resting place. We prayed the same prayer. that Aaron bestowed on the Israelites before they began their journey to Mount Sinai to the Promised Land. And the prayer was this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Let the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. A hurtful memory.
would suggest to everyone who preaches or is any type of ministry at all to have a deep, deep prayerful life in which they personally experience Christ as their personal Savior. You have to have that relationship in my mind. You have to have encountered Christ personally. Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. I'm glad you enjoyed this episode of Sunday to Sunday. Please click on the subscribe button to the right so that you don't miss out on the next episode. And while you're here, check out all our faith and scripture resources, including our The Word newsletter, by visiting www.americamag.org faith.